Paper was like gold in medieval times. Oh, not tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Our whole plan was just to just get out of town, just go for a little drive. We've been going up to that cabin for years, man, since we were in high school. It's our own little getaway, you know? I like to fish, I like to shoot. Once we got there, we decided to, you know, go shooting. I'm actually the first one to see the guy. As he got closer, you kind of just, like, could tell by his face that kind of crazy or something's wrong with him, you know? He had a gun. I had that gut feeling like, shit, dude. Tell or not, I'm gone, dude. Gone. Come on, dude, let's go, let's go. Bakersfield, California resident John Perez prepares for an annual summer guys weekend with his two lifelong friends. The 19-year-olds look forward to this trip every year. At the time, I was freshman in college. I just had a young mindset, not too sure what I was doing with my life at that time. I was just <laughs> kind of having fun, put it that way. I was very, I was very young, man, very immature. I mean, all three of us were very immature, just kind of doing immature things. It's tradition for John and his friends to go to this cabin every summer after the school year to spend a few days doing target practice, relaxing and enjoying the solitude of the deep remote woods. We've been going up to that cabin for years, man, since we we're in high school, and uh, we would actually ditch school to go up there and we'd have parties up there, man. Their own little getaway, you know. I loved it. I mean, I'm an outdoor person, you know. I like to fish, I like to shoot, I like to be in the water, you know. And our whole plan was just to just get out of town, just go for a little drive. John gets a call right before they leave that almost stops the trip before it even happens. I was the one that drove us up there. I just started a part-time job. I remember they called me in that day. They had asked if I wanted to work that day. And I was like, uh. He was all like, you think you can come in? I was like, I'm busy. I had family problems. I had family, something going on. And... John deftly avoids taking the shift at work. His friends are relieved, and they continue to pack up the truck and head out to the private family cabin. The family, they own a bunch of uh, land out there. The place we went to is about, what, 50 miles out, almost a, little, a 10 minute drive, and it's all rugged terrain. It's all uphill, rocks. You need off-road vehicles, four-wheel drive, of course, to get up to where we got to. It's all trees and hills, man. Just trees, hills, dirt, <laughs> rocks. It is a mountainous area. You have steep cliffs. You have uh, rocky terrain. It's pretty much on the edge. It butts up from forest to, to desert. Extremely hot and uh, very difficult terrain to traverse. To get through this is dangerous. You're looking at not only extreme heats in the summertime, but you have rattlesnakes. You could fall, twist an ankle, whatever. It's not easy to get in there, it's not easy to get out. The location of the cabin is remote and isolated, far from any neighbors, highways, modern conveniences, and even cell phone reception. John and his friends enjoy being able to unwind have a little fun in the tranquility of nature on their own terms and at their own pace. No communication most of the time. 
out there, people get, go out there to be left alone. They don't care about cell phones and things of that nature. It's kind of a, a getaway for most people. This is why they have vacation homes out there. So no, cell phones don't work. You don't have a hard line that you can call from in your house. Um, these are very remote areas. The guys arrive at the staging cabin and start to unpack their truck. The main cabin is only accessible through thick brush and the truck won't make it down. I've never been up there where I've seen somebody in those trailers or those cabins. I've never seen nobody. There's a bottom cabin we call the, the package cabin and uh, that's where the house with the guns and that's where we load and we bring our drinks, whatever we want. And that's the place we, we would stay the night at if we needed to or, you know, that's where my buddy's dad was living at the time. That's where I had parked my truck and I made sure to leave my phone, left my keys, my wallet, just little things, you know, it was just so I don't lose it. I've been going there for years, so was, I just knew it was just unnecessary to bring stuff like that. They load up their supplies into an off-road vehicle and begin to drive down through the thick brush to the lower, more isolated cabin. From there, it's a dirt road. We get to a peak of a hill and there's a gate. You know, we have to unlock it. It drops about a mile down and it's very windy and it drops us right into the, the cabin. Actually, we just straight down into the cabin. John and his friends are talking and laughing about their previous day and the fun they're gonna have this time out. We took that thing for a ride, man. The three friends intend to relish every moment of this trip, including the long ride to the even more secluded lower cabin. That cabin is like a party cabin. That's where everyone goes up to. I guess they hold like little events up there. It has a, it has a gun range. It has a few rooms. It has restrooms. It has a like a man-made little pond, actually. It's filled with like targets. You have the little discs that you can shoot. And it has a few off-road vehicles. It has an RV. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a setup. Once we got there, we decided to, you know, go shooting. My buddy Will had just got a gun, a new rifle, a new 22 set up, had a dot on it, red dot sight. It was beautiful. After arriving, the boys walk over to a nearby man-made pond to chill out. We leave our guns in the back of the off-road vehicle. The guys feel safe in their isolation, but that sense of safety soon disappears. We're about 10 feet away, 10, 15 feet away from our off-road vehicle, and um, they're just off looking at the pond. And I was off on my own little road. Upon arrival of the property, a stranger, young man, shows up. I'm actually the first one to see the guy. And I kind of just like looked. I was like, okay, that has to be like his family or something. Like, John alerts his friends to the uninvited visitor. I think these individuals, when they ran into this person, there would obviously be some red flags going off. They would probably try and, uh, if they had to, talk to this person and try and get them themselves out of that situation. John's mind is racing at the potential threat the trespasser brings because only locals would know about this spot. Where did he come from? How long has he been there? John's fears heighten because he knows it would take a motivated outdoorsman to find this place. The only people I know that can probably get to that spot is people that know the area. I, I didn't think nobody in this world could find this place. Nobody. And our whole plan was just to just get out of town, just go for a little drive. The place we went to is about 15 miles out. The family, they own a bunch of uh, land out there. We've been going up to that cabin for years, man, since we were in high school. And uh, we would actually ditch school to go up there and we would have parties up there. But I loved it. I mean, I'm an outdoor person, you know. I like to fish, I like to shoot. So you need off-road vehicles, four-wheel drive, of course, to get up to where we got to. It's our own little getaway, you know? 
It is a mountainous area. You have steep cliffs. You have uh, rocky terrain. It's pretty much on the edge. It butts up from forest to, to desert. Very difficult terrain to traverse. You, to get through this is dangerous. You're looking at not only extreme heats in the summertime, but you have rattlesnakes. You could fall, twist an ankle, whatever. It's not easy to get in there. It's not easy to get out. No communication most of the time. It's kind of a, a getaway for most people. This is why they have vacation homes out there. That cabin is like a party cabin. That's where everyone goes. It has a gun range. It has a few rooms. It has like a man-made little pond, actually. I've never been up there where I've seen somebody in those trailers or those cabins. I've never seen nobody. Upon arrival of the property, a stranger, young man, shows up. I'm actually the first one to see the guy. John has never seen this person before in his life and is leery as the stranger approaches the group. They expected that uh, they were alone. They show up at their family cabin. I mean, how many times have they done that over and over again? People hunt out there all the time, and this was just going to be one of their weekends, you know, having fun. And then they're met on their property by this stranger. I was the one that told him, I was like, Will, there's somebody here. I was like, is that, is that like your family or something? Like your, one of your uncles or something? And he looked and he was like, he came closer and closer and he's like, nah, dude, I don't know who that is. Each of the friends are suspicious because they don't know where the trespasser is coming from, what he wants, what his intentions are. I had that gut feeling like, shit, dude. It don't, it don't feel too good. And like, my first instinct was just kind of stuck. I was just thinking of like many things, like it's not your family. Maybe he's just from the area. And... He's on the property. Um, they believe that he came from the cabin. He looked like he was hunting, dressed in green. He had a corduroy hat. He had a gun. He had a, he actually had a, a shotgun, sawed off, and then he had his 22 on his back. And these individuals ran into this armed person. Really, they'd have to stay calm. They would have to try and work through it. They'd, their survival skills would be kicking in there. As he got closer, you know, I looked more, and he had a knife hanging out, like his sleeve. He looked like he was ready for something, to get into something. As he got closer, you kind of just, like, could tell by his face that, like, that kind of a person. That's just, like, kind of crazy. or Something's wrong with him, you know? The guy approached us, and... He told him, what are you guys doing on my property? And the three young men said, well, you know, this is actually our property. Uh, you're trespassing. And he's like, what are you guys talking about? It's a naval base. This is an abandoned naval base. And we stood for a second, looked at each other, and that's when my buddy goes, nah, man, you're trespassing. You're on my property. You need, you know, you need to leave. And that's when it went downhill from there. It's just, the argument got more aggressive. The moment the stranger tells them this is a naval base and they were on his land, it's the three friends on high alert. John realizes there is something wrong with this person. I can tell that he looked very scared himself. Like, he was, like, getting very defensive. Because we're like, dude, you got, you know, you got to get out of here. Like, you need to leave. This is private property. You're trespassing is what he's doing. And he, he was already, like, kind of, like, prancing back and forth, kind of, like, thinking of what he was going to do. And, like, you could tell by, like, he starts sweating. Like, you can see the sweat dripping down his face. I mean, we're just as scared as well. The trespasser is pacing and sweating. He's making false statements, making John believe he's unstable and possibly dangerous. He fears things will only get worse. John discreetly walks away from the group, hoping to get away to safety. While they're arguing, uh... I had enough already, man. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to walk that way. I just walked back, turned around, and I didn't even get a foot <laughs> past him. And that's when he actually drawed the shotgun on me. We've been going up to that cabin for years, man, since we were in high school. We would actually ditch school to go up there and we wouldn't have parties up there, man. It's our own little getaway, you know? And our whole plan was just to just get out of town, just go for a little drive. No communication most of the time. It's kind of a, a getaway for most people. 
that cabin is like a party cabin. That's where everyone goes. So it has a gun range, it has a few rooms, it has like a man-made little pond, actually. I've never been up there where I've seen somebody in those trailers or those cabins. I've never seen nobody. Upon arrival of the property, a stranger, young man, shows up. I'm actually the first one to see the guy. As he got closer, you kind of just like can tell by his face that I'm like that kind of a person. It's just like kind of crazy or something's wrong with him, you know. He had a, he actually had a, a shotgun, sawed off, and then he had his 22 on his back. We stood for a second, looked at each other, and that's when my buddy goes, "You're on my property. You need you know you need to leave." And that's when it went downhill from there. He looked like he was ready for something, to get into something. I had enough already, man. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna walk that way. I just walked back, turned around, and I didn't even get a foot <laughs> past him. And that's when he actually drawed the shotgun on me. My first instinct was to just drop it, hit the ground, man. And I was just like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, he was not even 10 feet, five feet away from me kind of like, not in front of my face, but enough to kill me one shot. <laughs> He's like, you're not leaving. He's like, get up, get up, you know, telling me to get up. And I was just like, I was like, put the gun down. And I remember my buddies were like, what are you doing? Like, put the gun down, put the gun down. And like, I look and I just see them like, you could just tell by their, their facial expression that they're just like, this is really happening right now. The situation is escalating. John sees the trespasser getting more and more anxious and agitated. He's worried for all of their safety. I don't know what I was doing. I was just like scared for my life, in other words. I was shaking, man. John feels vulnerable and exposed with no place to run for cover. We're still like right by the cabin. So it was pretty steady ground. Um, we're, and all three of us were literally right next to each other. A shotgun is a extremely deadly weapon. Um, depending on the ammo you have in there, you don't have to be very accurate, and it can pretty much put those three three young men down rather quickly. So, trying to run for it, trying to rush him, anything like that, could have ultimately they they wouldn't have walked away from there. These individuals, even though they had weapons on their quads, the Suspect in this case definitely had the jump on them. He had his guns at the ready, and they would have been at a disadvantage had they chose to go uh, and try and retrieve their own firearms. My mind at the time was just too shocked to think about anything. Like, There's no doubt in my mind, I, I thought we were going to die for sure, man. I didn't say a word. I, the only time I would really say stuff is when he would draw the gun on us or he would he would go into, I'm gonna kill myself. There was a point in time where he was like, I'm gonna just kill myself, like. No, like, we're just already like, no, dude, like, you don't have to do that. Like, you don't have to do that. Like, just go on your way and we'll go on our way. Like, just, just go. And um, we kept arguing back and forth outside. He was telling us weird, just the most weirdest things ever, man. Like, the government's after him. There's police after him. He said the government dropped him from space in a body bag. And he had hit the floor like a bullet. And he used like his body bag as a as a um, a parachute. Yeah, it's just like, what? You know? So he draws a gun and he's like, Do you guys have, you know, cell phones? Do you guys have money? What do you have on you, you know? And he searched us. He searched all three of us. He made us empty our pockets, made us uh, do a full 360. We had nothing. Surprising we didn't have a handgun that time. We usually always have a handgun every time we go up there. And had absolutely nothing. We just had rifles. Quite honestly, the fact that they were able to continue talking to him and just kind of buy their time was probably the best thing they could do. John's worst fears are realized when the trespasser finds their guns on the ATV. He he goes to the off-road vehicle. First thing he sees was the guns. 
and he's like, oh, you guys have guns, like, like, he started, that's when he started tripping again. He's like, are they loaded, you know, we were just kind of looked at each other, like, didn't say anything, kind of just let it go, and he picked up two of the guns. He's actually pointing out a cabin, and he just pulled the trigger. He, nothing shot. I know he took the clip out of one of them. He's like, it's loaded, though. And we're like, yeah. And like, I don't know what he was trying to do, but he ended up, he put it in wrong. It actually messed up the whole entire gun. And I, I, he tried shooting it again, and just, that's when it choked. Boom, nothing. He's like, you guys brought up guns that didn't work. And we looked at each other, like, yeah. Yeah, we brought up guns that don't work, man. You know, we just went with it. You know, you don't expect someone to be out there in the middle of nowhere on your property, you know, uh, pointing your gun at you. My buddy's like, just came up with the lie instantly. My, my dad's coming up in an hour. He's like, he's coming in an hour. And he has guns or, you know, and it, it made him like, like get all like, oh, well, well, shit, I better go. Like, you know, like I need to leave. And then like, yeah, 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 you need to leave. They told him that, listen, our parents are on their way too. You know, we have more people coming. They're gonna be here any time now. Uh, kind of thinking on their feet, which I, I have to give him kudos for that, to, to think on their feet, considering he's pointing a gun at him, they're thinking, I'm, I'm gonna die right now. You always have one of those friends that quick to like run away or quick to, you know, put somebody out. But luckily we were all just, on the same page. We knew one little mistake, you know, we were, that's it. We're brothers, man, hung out every single day. <laughs> if you're with your friends for years and years, you know how they think, you know what they do. Um, the fact that they were able to do that and, and get him to believe it was uh, impressive. It was impressive. John believes they've convinced the trespasser to leave and feels a sense of relief, but that won't last long. The gunman orders each of them into the cabin at gunpoint. It's like, well, before I leave, I'm going to put you guys in a room one by one. And that's my heart dropped again, man. We've been going up to that cabin for years, man, since we were in high school. We would actually ditch school to go up there, and we would have parties up there, man. That cabin is like a party cabin. That's where everyone goes. So it has a gun range. It has a few rooms. It's our own little getaway, you know? I've never been up there where I've seen somebody in those trailers or those cabins. I've never seen nobody. Upon arrival of the property, a stranger, young man, shows up. I'm actually the first one to see the guy. As he got closer, you kind of just like can tell by his face that kind of crazy or something's wrong with him. You know? He had a gun. He looked like he was ready for something. He actually drawed the shotgun on me. My first instinct was to just drop it, hit the ground, man. And I was just like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, A shotgun is a extremely deadly weapon. It can pretty much put those three young men down rather quickly. I was just like scared for my life. I was shaking, man. He goes to the, our off-road vehicle. The first thing he sees was the guns. And he's like, oh, you guys have guns? like. There's no doubt in my mind, I, I thought we were gonna die for sure. You know, you don't expect someone to be out there in the middle of nowhere on your property, you know, uh, pointing a, your gun at you. We were locked in the middle room next to the storage. And it was a very small room, you know. Uh, you just had the bunk beds and, and the, the restroom. Room. He had trash bags full of things. He had tarps. And we're just like, again, like, assuming like the worst, like already, like what the, like what is he gonna do, you know? Being in a remote area, as a hostage specifically, does not bode well for those individuals just because there is no quick police response in most cases. And he's like, I'm gonna get some things ready. Told my buddy to grab the trash bags full of stuff. The bags contain food, drinks, ammunition, and propane tanks. The guys suspect that the trespasser has been staying there for some time. John is deeply concerned that the trespasser could have planned and knows they need to get out. He 
So we give him the bags, he takes them, he walks outside, closes the door, and we instantly just start looking around, like, what does he have in here? Like, what the hell? Like, what do you, you know? And we didn't find nothing. Comes back to the room, and he starts telling us stories. That's when he started telling us stories, like saying he's tired of being raped. Very awkward things, like, what? You know, like, what are you talking about, man? I think any hostage uh, situation like this goes right into survival skills and any kind of conversation where you think it's going to advance your chance of being released or not harmed, I think is a good thing. It looked like he was talking to like a soda bottle or something, man. He was just in and out of the one room. He would come in and out, and uh, I think part of that was also they were telling him, you know, our parents are going to be here any time now. And so he's expecting other people to show up, so I don't think he wanted to get he didn't want to get caught off guard. I think part of it was uh, paranoia. And, uh, you know, like mentally ill people, you don't realize what's going on with them. You can't really figure out um, what's in their head at that time. It was quiet in the room, pure silence. I mean, we're just all like, just burnt out already, man. We were arguing for our lives. And I just remember looking at, my buddy, I'm really looking at the other one. I was like, dude, I want to get my bed. That's the only thing I remember myself saying. Was, came back, then he started giving us tips. He's like, you guys need to drink water for your hike back. Because the hike was 15 miles, man. A mile of it was uphill. He's like, drink water, drink soda. He's like, but don't drink the booze. You guys will get dehydrated. Just, what the hell? Left again. The fact that they, you know, they had already told it that he had taunted him pointed the gun at him several times and was just like, you know, playing with them. That they could just sit there and, and still keep cool, uh, that, that shows uh, a good strong character that they were able to, to work through their fears and, and still do the right thing. Comes back in, pointed at me, he pointed at all of us and he's like, I could have killed you guys and I could have got away with it. And nobody would have knew. He taunted him for a while would point the gun at him and say, bang, bang, bang. Um, you, could, you could be in heaven right now. He was, he was packed up, ready to go, dude, ready to leave. And he pointed at me. He's like, these two guys are fine. He's like, but you? He's like, you hate me. So I could just tell. And I looked at him, and I was just like, I don't hate you. I was like, I'm just scared. And he's all like, that means you hate me. And I was just like, I don't. He's like, then tell me you don't you don't hate me. And to my eyes, I'm like, I don't hate you, you know? And then he, he looks at us, he's like, he's like, the reason I didn't kill you guys was because the youth. He's like, I have respect for nothing but the youth. Yeah, he's, he's like, I have nothing but respect for youth. I love you guys, and you guys are my friends. Closes the door. Then the boys hear the ATV start up outside. So we hear him turn on. Engine's revving for a little bit. Look at each other. Just kind of sit there and sit there and just wait. Takes off, you know, you hear him gladly take off. And you just hear it fade away, you know, that, that, like just fading away. John knows there's a narrow window for escape. He jumps at the chance. No ifs, no buts, spot it. First one out the door, gone. Left him, even, I even left my friend. I was like, come on or not, I'm gone, dude. When the opportunity presented itself that they could uh, make good their escape, it was definitely the right time to leave the cabin. First thought was, boom, hit the creek bed. Just sat there, kind of like kneeled a little bit, like waited for my buddies to come. One of my buddies was looking for like a, some type of weapon, got a knife. And we're, me and my other buddy were ready in the creek bed by the time. Like, come on, dude, let's go, let's go. They waited until that moment where they felt they could try and get away. For this specific uh, situation, yes, they made the right gamble. Um, you never know with, with uh, unstable individuals. They're unpredictable. And um, so it, it really is something that uh, you just don't know what the outcome's going to be. The stranger returns to the cabin and sees that the boys have fled. We walked the creek bed, but it was, it was already late. It was almost, what, 7, almost 8 o'clock. You could tell the sun was going down now. We're in the creek bed, and we see him from a top trail. He was heading towards another cabin, and we instantly
recently hid. That cabin is like a party cabin. That's where everyone goes. So it has a gun range, it has a few rooms. It's our own little getaway, you know? Upon arrival of the property, a stranger, young man, shows up. As he got closer, you kind of just like can tell by his face that kind of crazy or something's wrong with him, you know? He had a gun. He looked like he was ready for something. He actually drawed the shotgun on me. A shotgun can pretty much put those three young men down rather quickly. I was just like scared for my life. I was shaking, man. He goes to our off-road vehicle. First thing he sees was the guns. And he's like, oh, you guys have guns? Like, there's no doubt in my mind, I, I thought we were gonna die for sure. You know, you don't expect someone to be out there in the middle of nowhere on your property, you know? pointing your gun at you. We were locked in the middle room next to the storage, and it was a very small room, you know, and he had trash bags full of things. Like, what is he going to do, you know? He taunted him for a while, point the gun at him. When the opportunity presented itself that they could uh, make good their escape, it was definitely the right time to leave the cabin. For this specific uh, situation, yes, they made the right gamble. You never know with unstable individuals. They're unpredictable. These hostages had a difficult decision to make, escape or get taken hostage again. And I think they made the right decision by taking that leap of faith. They could use the forest to their advantage. As hard as it is to navigate through it, it would make it just as hard for somebody to track them to the forest. And we walked the creek for a little bit, and then there's a point in time where, like, we're not getting anywhere. Like, we have no weapons, we have no light. Uh, there's it's wildlife out there, man. You know, we could have easily got attacked by any type of animal, really. Mountain lions, bears, whatever's out there. And we go, we all agreed to walk the main road. The boys move quickly and cautiously, being careful not to alert the trespasser to their whereabouts. We were paranoid, man. I was paranoid. Every five seconds I was looking back, I thought I heard something, or super paranoid. And we just kept walking down the road. And we got to a point where we barely, we barely missed them. The stranger closes in, and the friends know they are close to being caught and maybe even killed. Their only option to escape is to jump off a dangerous mountain cliff and hope they survive the fall. It doesn't take them long to decide what to do. We, we jumped off the mountain, man. We, all three of us just jumped off the mountain because he was coming towards us, and he was going back towards the cabin. Just hid till we heard the, the, the players fade away. Still feeling on edge, John and his friends continue through the woods. When he found out they were gone, he took the quad that they had arrived in, and he was driving throughout the forest all over the place for several hours looking for them. He was armed still. If he had caught them, he wasn't going to march them back to the cabin. More than likely, he would have shot them where they stood, and then uh, and no one would have known. We would have found three dead young men in the forest, and that'd be about it. I feel like there's, there's times where we're more paranoid, and the winds were throwing us off a lot, but... It was probably better to be paranoid than not, so we didn't get caught. I think it was more, we, we could tell by like the rising dirt, you can see it in the distance, so it gives a heads up. It's escape and evade, is what it is. It's you're, you are trying to keep from being discovered. With a quad, he has lights. He's able to illuminate large areas. They have to try and maintain a low profile, try to stay behind bushes, rocks, things of that nature. They, they had to through the whole time. They're, they're in fear, they're running, so they're out of breath. Uh, these are things that they have to control so that he can't detect where they're at. The stranger continues his unrelenting search through the evening on the ATV, driving up and down dirt roads, desperate to find the three friends. John's mind races with the thoughts of why they were targeted. Somehow we all, we went unseen, but we seen, we had a perfect view of him. And to me, he looked like, that was the last time I seen him. He looked like he had the face of, like he was on a mission to do something, like he was going back to that cabin. So, 
looked like he was going back to kill us. Like he had that, that face and we just all looked at each other, sat there for a minute. I'm like, dude, let's go. Let's just, let's just go. And one of my buddies was actually pretty sick. Didn't look good at all. And we walked miles, kind of stood back with him a little bit. We had to do that a mile hike uphill. And, but once we got uphill and we were closer to home, and, and then that's when I got in an argument with one of my buddies because he didn't want to lock that gate. I was like, dude, just lock the gate, just lock it. He's like, that guy has the keys. It's like, I don't care, just lock it. You know, almost fought. So there's a rule that we go by when we go up there, shooting or hunting or whatever, we have to be back by sundown. No ifs and buts about it, you know? And we never we never went against that rule. We always listened. And it was, sun was already down by the time where we started walking up. One of the parents of the three young men, I guess, didn't get a phone call from him. And so he was coming up to check on him, and they happened to run into him on this dirt road. The father is relieved to see them, but angry that they didn't report back and call when they were supposed to. It was a dad, and he just instantly chewed our asses out right then and there. Not knowing what was going on, just chewed our asses out. And then my buddy broke down, and that's when he was just like, we just had got a shotgun pointing at our heads for two hours straight. And my buddy's dad just kind of like looked, and he's just like, wait, what? Finally safe. They call the police to report the trespasser, which sets off a statewide manhunt. Boom, first thing he did was call the cops. So once the police have established this individual's identity, it put the pressure on the police agency to really get that individual in custody as fast as possible. First thing he did was call the cops. The 29th of July is when a specialized unit uh, that we have for the sheriff's department that has some of my SWAT team members on it went up there to see what went down. Looked around, looked like he had been staying there for a while, and then fled the area. They managed to find the quad. He got it stuck and he couldn't get it out. So uh, the suspect took whatever he had and fled on foot. Uh, based on the terrain and everything, could not track him. And uh, that was it. That's where the, the, the search stopped at that point because we didn't have any other clues of where to go. On the 29th of July, we uh, get a call from the wife of a retired dentist from Tehachapi. He had went to their vacation home to work on water lines and whatever, just cleaning up on the property, because it's such a remote place, and they found uh, the retired dentist dead. So they called the sheriff's department. We find this information out. We managed to find, just outside the property, there was a draw where we had found uh, a boot print. And that's when we determined this is probably him. There was no, no one else around here. And uh, the search started from there. Once the dentist is murdered, that really puts a lot of pressure on the police now to find this individual and arrest this individual because they do know he's willing and able to commit murder and that uh, they want to stop that and bring this to a, a resolution as quick as possible. We tracked the boot uh, prints and would find caches. One of them was a water bottle that uh, we were able to get a DNA match on. And that was our first break in knowing who this person was. Uh, it turned out to be a guy by the name of Benjamin Ashley. He was a drifter that would break into your home, take your stuff, and, and then move on to the next and, and just see how far I can get. Uh, once we had that, then we had a picture of him because he had been arrested before. So once we had a face, we put that out on the news. While we were tracking, we get to a point out there in the desert that there is a compound 
We're just gonna clear these houses before we call it a day. We announced several times, Sheriff's Department didn't hear anything, didn't hear any movement. And then we made a decision of, okay, we're gonna clear the house. I was the first one in the door. And fortunately, uh, Benjamin Ashley was in a, a, a position in a laundry room that he could see me, but I couldn't see him. One moment I'm up, I heard a gunshot. I felt both the bones of both arms break, and then I'm looking at a ceiling. My team returns fire, but at that time, he ducked back into the laundry room. He managed to get out the back door. When I went down, our team's mission changed from going after him to saving my life. One of my partners grabbed a hold of my arm, one of my arms, and uh, dragged me out of the house onto the deck. My partners helped me get up because I couldn't lift myself up. Got me on my feet, and then we ran to a like a mound of dirt and a rock for cover, at which point I laid down and, and they uh, started trying to stop the bleeding and take me out of the area where uh, chopper could come in and, and pick me up and took me to the hospital. So in a lot of cases, when someone becomes homicidal, they also become suicidal. And that's always a risk that the police have to deal with. As law enforcement, we can't just kick in every door just to see if anyone's in there. So he was able to lay low and uh, it took 15 days of searching for him. Uh, one day he, uh, he shows up at a store. The uh, clerk recognized him from the pictures on the news and called the sheriff's department. Uh, several patrol deputies show up and when they arrive, they find him. He pulled a gun on him. They shot him several times in the body. Then he was able to take a gun and shoot himself in the head, uh, committed suicide. The investigation at that point ended. I felt terrible when I heard that. It kind of depressed me a lot. I'm a terrible feeling, like, knowing somebody died and that we probably could have prevented. But we're so you know, concerned about our lives at that time. I had no idea that was going to happen. I learned to be aware, you know. Like, it really, like, it was a crazy way to get brought into this world, you know. I was still young, like I said, barely graduated, and just, you know, not prepared for the worst, but be ready, because you don't know. You never know what's going to happen.